then I would really like to welcome Leonard Jason to this webinar. He has promised to introduce himself because uh, he has done so much research and has so much experience that I would get lost telling you about everything. So I'm sure he can give you the most relevant information there. So welcome, Leonard Jason, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation from the Norwegian ME Association. Um, I wish I could be there in person um, because uh, Norway is such a wonderful country. Um, I have been there in the past. But today I will be talking about pacing interventions. And once again, um, my name is Leonard Jason. Um, I am a psychologist at DePaul University. Um, and I've been working um, actually in this ME area um, since actually the early 1990s, as I will share with you some of my experiences. But first I wanted to mention that in the 1990s, we did a survey of 984 patients and we looked at their responses about preferred treatments. Um, and what people were asking for were self-help, social support services, and advocacy. Um, those were the things that people were needing. Um, someone who could come in and help them reduce some of the chores, um, some of the responsibilities and tasks that they had very little energy to do, um, and to be an advocate for them, for resources. Um, that's what patients wanted then. Um, I believe they continue to want these things now. Yet at the same time, in the mid 1990s, um, a gentleman named Verkulin came out with a model called cognitive behavior therapy. This model involved saying that patients with ME attribute their symptoms to physical causes, are overly preoccupied by physical limitations, do not maintain regular activity, and maintain a self-defeating preoccupation with symptoms. Our group at DePaul tried to actually analyze this model. Um, and what are the assumptions? The factors are hypothesized to cause individuals with ME to be functionally impaired. That implies that there's a central problem with the patients experiencing this condition um, and a psychosomatic preoccupation with one's fatigue. And at that time, a number of investigators endorsed a treatment approach that focused on convincing patients to recognize that their illness was not biologically based. Rather, a phobic avoidance of exercise due to psychological problems. This is actually the Verkulin model. This is what it looks like. Um, as you can see, causal attributions affect physical activity, Physical, reduced physical activity leads to impairment. Focusing on symptoms leads to impairment. And redu reducing physical activity and focusing on symptoms is definitely affecting the fatigue. This is what basically the model was. Um, and we tested it out several times with different samples. One of my doctoral students, um, Sharon Song, um, actually found that this model did not fit with patients with ME. Um, we looked at the chi-square, goodness of fit, um, non-normalized fit index, comparative fit, R-squared. We looked at a variety of different approaches to see if this model was accurate, and it didn't fit. Later in 2017, another doctoral student of mine, Madison Sundquist, um, again tried to replicate this model, um, and again, um, it was inconsistent. Um, individuals' activity level was unrelated to perceptions about illness etiology, and the results were inconsistent with the cognitive behavioral theory of ME that presumes that individual symptoms stem from deconditioning and maladaptive illness beliefs. And I might add, this was particularly true with those individuals who fulfilled more stringent case definitions. Well, if you ask patients, and this is one Norwegian survey, 
um, of about 800 individuals, 79% of participants with experience with graded exercise regarded this to worsen their health status. And pacing was evaluated as useful by 96% of participants. So given these results, um, and given our earlier survey that our group did in the 1990s, um, we really have been focusing on a very different approach than cognitive behavior therapy and graded activity. The conclusions that we made in the 1990s was that pacing might have considerable appeal over a cognitive behavior therapy model. So the question is, what does research tell us? And I'd like to review some of the work at DePaul over several decades. First thing, the idea of energy envelope was actually invented in 1993. Um, we developed a patient pacing type intervention called the energy envelope. And I think what's so interesting is that actually a patient um, in Chicago um, came up with the term. It's basically, she said, um, you should call this trying to help people stay within their energy envelope. We thought it was such a terrific term that that's what we have called the theory. The envelope theory recommends that patients with ME pace their activity according to their available energy resources. And at the same time in the 1990s, um, Dr. Ellen Gutsmith was developing her ideas in Great Britain, also on pacing with ME patients. So we really had two different groups who were coming up with a very alternative model um, really almost 30 years ago. So our rehabilitation intervention, the energy envelope, does not challenge patients' belief in a medical cause for their ME. It recommends that patients with ME pace their activity according to their available energy resources. What that means is they learn to stay within the energy envelope. So let's talk about what this energy envelope is about. We believe that symptoms worsen when the body and the brain are pressured to function beyond their current capacities. The objective is to stay within the energy boundaries, according to the energy theory. Over time, patients will restore energy, lessen pain and other symptoms, and lessen illness severity if they can learn to stay within that energy envelope. And it differs from graded exercise therapy um, because graded exercise says that you should maintain or increase exercise even if symptoms occur. And we do not concur with that theory. So let's try to make it a little bit clearer um, what we're talking about. If you can see this axis here from zero to 100, 100 is when you were probably before you got sick. It's like you're 100, you're, you're going at pace and you're fine. Zero is that you're like bedridden. So basically, this is the scale we use. Um, the ME battery, if you kind of think about their battery of energy, might be at a 20, somewhere between 20 or 30. A healthy battery might be at about 90. So you can see that the person's available energy is really considerably reduced when they have ME. So what is balance? Balance means that if a person's perceived energy, what they feel they have is comparable to what their expended energy is, what they're actually putting out. And if they can basically keep perceived and expended energy comparable, you can see here about maybe 50, that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're trying to achieve. Basically people learning to stay with their perceived or available energy is the same as how much they expend on a 100 point scale. This is a typical case of a person with ME. They might have a 50 in terms of expended energy, but their perceived available energy might be at a 25. So if they rate themselves at 25 out of a 100 point scale, but they basically say they're expending energy at 50%, there's an imbalance here. And we think that they're putting on stress onto their system 
and depleting that battery so that the battery no longer, it's just like a regular battery to a car. If you keep overextending the use of it, um, it will eventually get weaker. So we have done a number of studies um, evaluating this energy envelope beginning in the 1990s. And this is some of the basic research that we think supports these ideas using time series analyses, that means data over time, we found that patients' energy expended, physical exertion, and mental exertion were positively related to actigraphy. That's an electronic measure of activity levels. So that was good. That was validation of our measures. We also found a positive significant relationship between current fatigue and the amount of energy that participants perceived they had used two days prior. So again, there's a relationship between activity um, and um, their fatigue level. Additional studies we did, a correlation study that found that individuals with ME experienced a range of negative symptoms and disability when they extended beyond their energy envelope. Whatever their energy kind of available was, if they expended too much, we saw problems. And patients with ME can rate their weekly level of available and expended energy with good inter-rater reliability. So we have a reliable measure and a valid measure because it's related to all these other indices. So let me provide some case studies um, where we have tried to actually um, see if this actually works with patients um, over a um, period of time. Our first um, patient um, was someone who had, in March of 1996, a fatigue level about 35% on a 100-point scale, with zero being no fatigue, 100 being significant fatigue, um, at the most fatigue possible. Perceived energy, how much was available, was about 24 out of a 100-point scale. Expended energy was about 39. So they're basically, you can see, 15 percentage points are higher of what they're expending than what's available. And yet after a intervention involving learning how to stay within the energy envelope, look at this. The expended energy has increased. The perceived energy is now very close to the expended energy. This person has now learned to stay within their energy envelope and most importantly, look at the fatigue level. It's gone from 35% to 13%. Doesn't mean the person's cured, but the person has less fatigue and basically has more um, perceived energy. Let's take a look in more detail about this person. Here's some per periods of days. The red is when they're expending energy. And you can see on this 100 point scale, they're going way over their perceived energy, which is in green. So if they're constantly going over, they're going to basically be more fatigued. This is what happens when the person learned to stay within the energy levels within their envelope. You can see that the expended energy is very close to the perceived energy. The red and the green lines are very close. And you can see the fatigue level tends to remain low. And that's what we're trying to basically produce. People who can stay within their energy envelope and keep their fatigue level as low as possible. It doesn't mean that they're cured. It doesn't mean that they're 100% what they had been before the illness, but it does look like their battery, that energy, that perceived energy does increase if they can stay within that balance. Our second case study occurred with a 46-year-old female patient. Um, their perceived energy was less than 10. So this is a very um, person who's very affected with ME and their expended energy was about 25. So they're expending more energy than their perceived energy, which is not good. Well, this person visited a relative and perceived and expended energy then got into the envelope. And their fatigue ratings decreased from 95 
which was just about the most possible, to 75. Still a lot of fatigue, but if they could get more balance between their perceived and expended energy, actually by having the support of someone, a relative, um, who could do some of the tasks that they normally had to do before, we see an improvement. So that, again, suggests the importance of social support for people who have these types of problems. So the third study was a buddy program. Um, individuals with ME benefit from social support and personal assistance. And we basically trained up undergraduate volunteers um, from DePaul University. That's where I work at. And this program helps people to stay within their energy envelope. So they would get a buddy one hour per week. Um, 12 patients with ME got the buddy for four months and the other half did not. And we wanted to see if you had someone that was basically helping you stay within your energy envelope and take some of the things that you didn't have to do, maybe shopping, maybe cleaning, you know, helping out, that that could basically be a good thing. And the outcomes were, a significant reduction in fatigue severity for those who received the buddy program. Our next study involved three participants. Um, and again, we looked at perceived, expended, and fatigue severity. And this was the baseline for these particular patients. Um, and you can see fatigue is a 64 out of 100. So a zero is no fatigue, 100 is very high fatigue. Um, and so the person's got quite a lot of fatigue here at baseline, um, but you can see their expended energy, 76, is actually over their perceived energy, their available energy. So they're, they're about 11 points over, and they got a lot of fatigue. But the intervention where we basically, again, had a buddy program with the effort of trying to reduce them being outside their energy envelope. And here you see their perceived energy is 69, their expended energy is 70. So they are now closer to their staying within their energy envelope. And look at the fatigue. With treatment, the fatigue has reduced by almost half. Again, uh, indication that there's something positive going on with basically staying within the energy envelope. Our fifth study was a, an empowerment program. Um, and this was done um, a couple of years later. And we basically um, got a grant from the federal government, the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Um, and uh, Renee Taylor um, was the person in charge of that study. Um, we gave people illness management and treatment. These were patients with ME. Um, they had management groups with case consultation and free transportation and services were provided. And this is it. 50 individuals were randomly assigned to two groups. In year one, they got the intervention and some served as controls. In year two, the second group got the intervention and the first group was follow-up. So everyone got the intervention, just some got it before the others. That's a nice type of experimental design where everyone gets a program that we think is positive. So it was a four month intervention. And during that four month intervention, hour one was devoted to goal setting. In groups, members reported on behaviorally focused and attainable objectives and goals using individualized action plan. And hour two focused on the following, the envelope theory, cognitive coping, personal relationships, self-relaxation and coping, economic self-sufficiency, nutritional approaches, and employment issues. And for the next seven month period, um, case coordinators, people who recovered from ME, assisted each participant with supportive services. And that involved individualized self-advocacy training, assertiveness skills, and some financial support to create their own linkages to community-based services. And this is the evaluation, the quality of life. Um, you can see that the program participants, which are in the darker color, actually increased from baseline to post to follow-up, um, whereas the controls um, did not. And symptom severity, um, 
symptom severity for those who got the program decreased, whereas the controls, they actually increased. The sixth program was a buddy program. Um, and I think what you can see from all these programs are that we're not challenging the patient's perception as to what's causing this particular illness. We're providing them support. Um, you know, we provided them a program, services, resources. It's a very different approach than basically trying to push a person to exercise more. It's really trying to help a person navigate the difficult challenge of having limited energy so that they can basically keep staying within that energy envelope by pacing as opposed to, in a sense, doing too much because they haven't had a chance to basically, for example, clean the house because they've been too feeling ill. And then when they do it, they have a relapse because they do too much. Um, so what we want to do is take the burden away um, by helping people with professionals or paraprofessionals providing support, not by telling them that they don't believe in their symptoms. The sixth intervention was a buddy program. We had weekly visits by a student at DePaul, and they helped out with tasks that needed to be done in an effort to reduce some of the taxing demands and responsibilities that patients encounter. This model of rehabilitation focused on avoiding exertion in persons with ME. Um, and it was aiming to avoid setbacks and relapses while increasing their tolerance for activity. Participants with ME were randomly assigned to either a four-month buddy intervention or a control condition. Those who received the student buddy intervention had significantly greater reductions in fatigue and increases in vitality over time. So we'll show you this particular figure that you can see the group provided the buddy has a significant decrease. It's the dotted line over time. So you can see this, whereas the group not provided actually increases fatigue. And vitality, you can see the group that gets the intervention, the buddy, actually has more vitality. The group that doesn't actually decreases over time. So you can see providing supports seems to have an outcome difference in terms of vitality and symptoms. Here's our next intervention, which was a non-pharmacological intervention involving four different treatments. It was funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, and we had about 100 patients with ME who were provided um, biweekly meetings with a trained nurse therapist for 13 sessions. So there was baseline post six and 12 month follow-ups. This was a randomized study. so. Um, you know, had a lot of good controls. What we were most interested in is um, we didn't see many differences between the four different types of interventions, but we did, very interesting, looked at some biological measures that help us understand who improves and who doesn't. So we looked at improvers versus non-improvers over time on their physical functioning. And about half the sample had improvement in half about did not improve. Um, and there were no significant baseline differences on physical functioning for the improvers versus not improvers over time. Um, but the physical functioning for the improvers increased, um, which is what we were trying to do, find a group that improved and a group that stayed the same. Um, what was most interesting was that um, the improvers over time at baseline looked different than the folks who did not improve involving T and B cells in elevated NK numbers. So, so what that means is the non-improvers at baseline, the ones who would, would not improve with these types of intervention had an elevated um, immune response, a dominance of type two over type one. So what that means is those who are more severe immune baseline characteristic tended to not improve. Um, so ME is associated with the shift toward a type two immune response. And those with this pattern at baseline tended not to improve over the course of the trial. We did another look at cortisol baseline 
Um, and we looked at those who had abnormal versus normal baseline and abnormal cortisol over five testings during the day. We considered if it continued flat, if it continued to rise, if it was abnormally low. Um, and cortisol should kind of gradually decrease over time. So these were abnormal patterns. The patients whose baseline normal cortisol had most improvement over time um, for activity levels. So in other words, those whose baseline cortisol levels were normal had the best improvements on activity level, fatigue, severity, depression, and anxiety over time. Those who had normal cortisol increased decreasing levels of this particular immune marker in the abnormal cortisol group underwent a significant expansion. What that means is patients with normal baseline cortisol evidenced improvements on a number of immune and self-report measures. Patients who are most impaired on their HPA functioning at baseline were least able to improve when provided these non-pharmacological interventions. So what that suggests to us is that, in a sense, really, there's some people who their baseline characteristics is going to determine how well they do in these interventions. And the healthier ones are the ones who have more easy access to the resources to improve. So I think that it's very important to differentiate patients from the healthier versus not healthier um, for the sicker and less sick, because the ones who are actually the healthiest are the ones who are going to be able to improve the most. But we wanted to actually look at this a slightly different way with this group of 100 patients over time. And we got two groups. And we basically said some people had learned in their different interventions to stay close to their available energy. In other words, their perceived available energy and their expended energy they learn to get closer to it by a variety of different reasons. The interventions weren't directly focused on that, but some people learn that by these different interventions and other people did not learn how to stay within their energy envelope. And we said, would there be a difference in those two groups over time? And actually we found that um, those people who basically learned how to stay within the energy envelope on this physical functioning scale, which higher scores meaning better, actually increased over time. And those who basically did not learn to stay within their energy envelope actually had no change over time. So what that suggests is that these interventions don't cure people, but if for some reason you're learning to sort of pace and you're learning to stay within the energy envelope, that could be the common denominator of all these different types of interventions that are tried, that are trying to help people, which we think are some pretty stunning results. And this is kind of the results for fatigue. And you can see that those who stayed within the energy over time, this is wave one over wave four over time, and fatigue scores are going down for the pink group, that's the intervention group, whereas the controls, we see really no change in their fatigue. So fatigue can be reduced um, doesn't mean that they're well. I mean, this is still a five points scale um, and it's still got fatigue, but we can reduce fatigue. We can, we can increase physical functioning um, if we basically help people stay within their energy envelope. So um, I'm going to try to wrap some of this up. Um, and um, I think what we have found over a period of time of looking at um, individuals um, that the cognitive behavior therapy model has not been validated when it's been tested out theoretically. Um, and the PACE trial certainly is another demonstration of um, you know, some inadequacies in that model, um, as you probably know. That's that Lancet article um, that came out a while back. Um, and we think that there's considerable evidence um, for a pacing approach. Um, those who are able to stay within their energy envelope in this last study had significant improvement in physical functioning and fatigue severity. That study, as well as the other ones that I've mentioned, suggests that helping patients with ME 
maintain appropriate energy expenditures in coordination with available energy reserves can help improve functioning over time. So in summary, we think that there is evidence to support an envelope theory for pacing. Healthcare professionals that treat patients with ME might incorporate strategies that help patients self-monitor and self-regulate energy expenditures to pace activities and stay within the energy envelope. So our recommendations are to include biological measures with these types of clinical trials. Our recommendation is also that non-pharmacological interventions um, can be used with people with cancer, heart disease, and other types of interventions. But those that need these interventions are only one part of a treatment plan and not the entire treatment. So we think that learning how to pace is really helpful for lots of people with different types of conditions. But regardless of that, what we think is really important is that we just don't focus on pacing, that there's other things that need to occur as well. What are some of the implications? Well, primary care physicians are really need to learn more about diagnosing reasons for fatigue. Um, they need to be able to make referrals for psychiatric sleep and other evaluations when it's appropriate. They need to help patients prioritize complaints. They need to help control symptoms, um, pain, sleep, um, and referrals to more intensive treatments to psychologists, social workers, counselors, physical therapists, occupation therapists. Um, we'll give a couple other areas that we think basically could be very useful for patients. Um, one needs to have sleep um, difficulties taken care of. For example, if a person has difficulty falling or staying asleep, early morning awakenings or light unrestful agitated sleep, we think that's something that needs to be taken care of. Um, and there are sleep medications. Of course, um, I'm sure many people have tried some of them, but there's also sleep hygiene that could be tried. Um, regular sleep and wake times, bed for sleep and sex only, limit or eliminate daytime napping. If homebound, wear day and night clothes, comfortable mattress, if noisy earplugs, masking noise, and wind down activities before bed. And that's to dampen down mental activities and relaxation activities in bed. And then activity. Um, we think that um, pacing is really critical, staying within the energy envelope. And that plan needs to be individually developed um, so that one, in a sense, balances activity with rest. Um, and, um, and one of the key things is to avoid overexertion and kind of cycling. What cycling means is that um, if you kind of are feeling really exhausted and you can't do much and you rest, then it's often some of the types of things that one needs to do, like shopping for food or cleaning the house, taking care of kids, you might not have time to do that. So after resting, if you feel better, sometimes one tries to do too much. It's like a yo-yo effect, tries to get everything done. Um, and then at that point, um, there's kind of the post-exertional malaise, which is not good. So in a sense, um, the key idea is how to learn how to stay within that energy envelope pacing so that one's feeling a little better, not to overdo it. Um, and that's why we think pacing has been so effective. It helps people break some of that cycling that sometimes occurs. And if a person's not confined to the bed, um, there could be light weights for strength and stretching for flexibility. Those certainly are things that are good. Um, and they're all within a good rehabilitation plan. And I also might mention that um, nutrition um, is very important for everyone, whether one has ME or not. Um, Well-balanced diet is probably going to be different depending on some of you know, the, the ancestors um, and the genetics for your particular constitution. Um, you know, one needs to manage weight gain. When people get ME, sometimes they um, become less active. And as they become less active, um, they can gain weight. Um, and certainly minimizing sugar, caffeine, 
alcohol and tobacco. Um, and as you know, one of the symptoms of ME-CFS is alcohol intolerance. Um, so that's a good thing not to um, be having, um, particularly if you have that. And I'd say almost half of patients have alcohol intolerance. So that's something to consider. So there are commonalities in helping that we're talking about. Um, what we're trying to suggest is that all interventions involving staying with the energy envelope, pacing, with all the other things that I've mentioned, hope has to be mobilized um, and fear reduced. When one basically has a trauma of an illness like this, whether it's due to COVID or whether it's due to Epstein-Barr virus, um, when in a sense, it's a very scary time for a person to have such reduction of energy and symptoms. Anything we can do to basically give people hope is so important. And if we can do that, we can basically help a person on their journey. Um, it's also very important in interventions to focus on one symptom and really see if you can get some success there. So for example, um, maybe sleep, help a person with some sleep issues. Um, and if that occurs, they might have more faith and confidence to try something else. Um, the reason pacing is so cool is that it makes so much conceptual sense. sense. I think most patients um, like to be told that, you know, their illness is um, real, authentic, legitimized, and that there's a way of basically making things better. And functional improvements can occur over time. I think it's, um, we don't necessarily see that um, a person is cured, um, but what we do think is that a lot of improvement can occur so that they can um, you know, get on with um, some of the things in life that are so important to them. So critical issues for improvement. Um, and again, I'm just um, kind of summarizing all the things that I've been saying during this uh, lecture, and I'm kind of getting close to the end of my 40 minutes, which um, I kind of promised I would um, stick to. Um, you know, one is to learn to pace and stay within the energy envelope. Um, I think it's also to do what everyone can to have lifestyle changes to support your health. Your health is the most important thing. Everything else is second, because if you don't have your health, you're not gonna be available for others or yourself. Um, that might involve reprioritizing activities. What's important in life? You might not be able to do everything you once did or want to do, but that is important to recognize you have to learn how to pace. You have to learn how that battery can't be overcharged constantly and expect you to improve. So ultimately, there probably needs to be rebalancing of the lifestyle between work and leisure. Um, and um, to the extent, and if you can work, um, that's great. But if you can't work, um, you know, certainly there's other things one can do. Um, and um, ultimately, um, better coping with stressors. If you're not kind of just strung out and exhausted and, and have no energy and are basically pushing yourself way beyond your limits, everything is going to become more stressful. If you can basically stay within your energy envelope and be careful, um, you can actually start reducing some of the stressors. All right. Well, uh, I have uh, gone on for about 40 minutes, and um, I hope my comments have been helpful to um, the audience. And um, I'm available now to take some questions and happy to um, field those. Okay, thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, talk. There are no questions so far from the Q&A, but I have made some notes during uh, your talk, so I'll start. I have ME myself. I've been ill for 23 years. And one of the very difficult things I find is not just to stay inside my energy envelope because I there's so much I want to do, but actually finding out what the size of the envelope is. And I think that's something that very many people find difficult. Do you have any ideas or 
tips on how to do it and how to find out what your limits are? So I think something that's very helpful is to um, actually kind of rate um, on a daily basis kind of how you feel. Um, it's, and that's one way of keeping track of it. And you might even put it into an Excel document or just, you know, have notes on it of kind of saying, okay, um, today my perceived energy was 50. Um, in other words, if I was healthy, it would be 100. And today I feel about almost 50 like I was before. That's my available perceived energy. My expended energy today was about 75. <laughs> so that's a clear indication that you've, you've, you've probably done more than you usually do. Um, and you're probably almost three quarters of what you had been when you were healthy. Well, that's a lot of activity. Um, and then you can actually put something else down, which is what's your fatigue level on a hundred point scale. If fatigue is high, you know, toward a hundred, um, that's not good. If fatigue is like maybe under 20, um, so zero is no fatigue, 50 is, you know, considerable fatigue and a hundred is, you know, the highest level of fatigue. So if you measure every day, what's your fatigue level? What's your available energy on a hundred point scale? What's your um, expended energy, perceived energy P, expended energy E and fatigue. If you do that every day, you can actually get some feedback about, you know, well, you know, maybe you're going to a special event um, and that special event um, is going to be a party. And, you know, you want to maybe rest up a couple of days before that and maybe being kind of under kind of your available energy. So you're, you're basically, um, your expended energy is less than your available energy for a couple of days. And then you overdo it. You know, you're going to overdo it. You're going to basically be with friends. You want to be able to go out and have some friends, friendships and connections, but you know, you're going to be exhausted. So on that day, you really take it easy. And then the day after and day after that, you do the same thing. What that is, is that you're learning to basically not continue to push yourself and give yourself enough time to rest after, before something that's going to be a lot of energy consumption. So I think by keeping track of um, your available and your perceived um, energy and your expended energy and your fatigue, you can give yourself feedback that can allow you to um, begin to answer that question. Now, if you really are kind of very detailed, you know, for a day, you could do it on an hourly basis and just kind of see kind of what it's like. And you could actually see, are you pushing yourself beyond your energy on a, on a daily basis? And if you're doing that every hour, if you're doing that every day, um, you know, you're probably pushing yourself too much. And if you can just back off a little bit, stay within that envelope. No one's going to be there all the time. Um, but if you can stay close to it, um, then you're going to ultimately um, have some control over something. And as I said, sometimes having some control over something with a mystery illness that is so uncontrollable, where there's so many things that one has difficulty figuring out, um, actually provides a tremendous amount of validation and, and, and gives hope. I kind of emphasize that you want to basically kind of instill hope um, in patients um, so that they feel like um, you know, they can actually become more knowledgeable, get more information about their illness, their body, how it reacts to it, and ultimately that they might actually improve so that they can actually do more. They might not ever um, be like they once were, um, but they can still have a good quality of life um, if they're not exhausted all the time and constantly pushing and feeling lousy. Uh, I think, thank you for a good answer. Uh, one thing that I was really intrigued about was you talked about the uh, body system that you developed. Um, the model for this system, is that available? It just strikes me that this would be a very good thing 
as a patient, if you could educate your friends and your family on what you need and why you need it, it might be a good help. Or do you educate carers? So I think um, when patients um, get the devastating blow, whether it's, um, you know, COVID um, or whether it's, you know, you know, Epstein-Barr or, you know, whatever the virus is or the bacterial infection that could also set a person up, um, they, they, they don't know what's going on. They sort of say, why am I not recovering um, when everybody else seems to recover um, where most people recover, although COVID has sort of changed some of that perception of the general public <laughs> that, you know, some people do not recover. Um, so that's a good thing um, that, you know, we do know um, that some people um, are going to need some time um, to recover. So they need support. They need help. They need someone to do their grocery shoppings. They need someone to do the cleaning. They need someone to take care of the kids. And they're not going to be working um, or they're going to be home, maybe doing some work, but they need time to rest and really let their body recover. That's what they need. How do we provide that to them? Our society doesn't do a good job. Um, we don't have buddy systems or social service people that can come in and do the type of work that I described. It's very desperately needed. Um, and if you can't have someone from the state or the city um, that's basically employed to do that, um, if you're fortunate um, to have a spouse or have children or have relatives or have friends that can help you, it's a very tricky course um, how to get help from people that you care and love without making them feel that they're being overused. Yes. So in a sense, it's a very delicate thing. And, and you have to be like almost a psychologist to figure it out <laughs> or a social worker, because you have to sort of say, how much can I ask? Um, I have a friend. And if I ask them to do grocery stopping for me once every two weeks, is that going to strain the relationship? Um, or are they going to basically feel that's too much? Um, or I've got someone who's a, a child, um, you know, and how much do I disclose about how I feel and how much they can be helpful depending upon their age? Very complicated stuff um, to figure out. Um, and, and in a sense, it's very easy to cut off um, your relationships with friends um, because, you know, a lot of friends, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to um, stay with you when you get sick. Um, you know, the ones that are your true friends will, um, but a lot of friends, um, you know, are just too busy kind of with their own kind of lives and, you know, they couldn't be bothered. And the same thing happens with family members. Some family members um, are going to be available, um, but some are not. Um, and some are going to reject the person because they haven't gotten well. And they basically say, you have to get well and do these responsibilities. And if you don't, I'm leaving you. Um, and that does happen. Um, so when you have a serious illness that's incredibly debilitating, you have to basically be so careful how you're engineering your relationships with these social networks. Because if you basically make more errors, not intentional, but errors by making demands of people who can't fulfill those requests, you can alienate people too. And that's not what you want to do. So it's a very delicate diplomatic process that needs to occur as you try to engineer a support system. And truthfully, our society shouldn't require the patient to have to do this, yeah. but it does because there's often nobody else um, that's going to help you. And that's unfortunate. Yes. Uh, there is a question here from, we have an audience in Finland even, not just in Norway. Uh, and she's saying that in Finland, they have just got new uh, guidelines for ME and which are excellent. But ME is still treated as a functional disorder. Hence, we have no pacing instructors or groups and very little material about this method. Are there international online fora that one could join 
or a website with good material to get started? So, you know, this is, you know, it's interesting that, uh, as you probably know, um, getting funded to set up programs or to do basic research um, is really a challenge. Uh, most of the interventions that I talked to you about, we did um, on our own. We did get some federal grants. Um, and, you know, with COVID, um, and particularly long COVID, um, in a number of countries, there are more resources that are becoming available for treatment. Um, but still, people with ME um, often are not included. And I mean, it's really amazing that uh, we have our first um, antiviral treatment trial coming out in the United States. And one of the <laughs> criteria are, which is kind of hard to believe, that um, you're um, not included in this trial of like 1,700 people around the United States with an antiviral um, if you've had ME. If you had ME, you're excluded. <laughs> um, and that's that's uh, that's unfortunate. Um, there really needs to be, um, you know, funding um, for um, ME um, for these types of programs. But it's very difficult um, to get that funding for the types of lifestyle management programs or dissemination of them that would be so useful. Um, so I wish I wish there was more available. Um, and I think there's a groundswell of interest. Um, and as I said, if you look at um, poll after poll and you ask patients what's the most useful and helpful, they will tell you, yeah, if I learn how to pace, if I make this lifestyle change, I will have the greatest effect. And that's what has helped me the most. Well, if that's the case, why aren't we researching it with yes. funded trials? <laughs> yes. Very, very difficult to do that, which is uh, um, it's, 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 it's very unfortunate. Uh, we had a big survey in, in Norway as well with nearly 5,800 respondents. And again, pacing was obviously the, the one thing that helped most people. Uh, there are, however, some questions here asking about which, um, which physical uh, measures did you do in these studies? Was it just the... Uh, there was something about uh, the immune system and about cortisol. Was there anything else? Or did you use any kind of, um, what do you call it, actiograph or anything like that to measure levels of activity? Or was it just the, the patient's perceived level of activity? So we have used actiographs on some studies. Um, and we have used um, basically physical functioning measures like the SF36. Um, and we have used um, questionnaires um, that help us look at symptoms like the DePaul symptom questionnaire, which we have developed and is now actually used in Norway. Um, we have a, um, a 54 item questionnaire and we just have built one of about 20 more items, which we call DSQ2. Um, we also have a short form, which actually is able to classify patients into pretty good case definitions. It's just 14 items. And we're actually now working on a brief the Paul symptom questionnaire with the four items. So we've got a slew of measures. Um, we also looked at cortisol and immune functioning in some of our trials to sort of show that it turns out that people who are the sickest are the ones who don't improve um, with these interventions because they're sick. Um, and um, and probably a lot of the trials that are out there um, are dealing with people who are healthier, um, and that's why you get some of those improvements. Um, if you can get to the office and you can get into the clinical trial, um, that involves a certain amount of energy and ability. Um, so I think we really de do need to recognize that uh, um, there are different types of ME um, and probably it, you know, our group has been trying to classify people into those who meet um, what we call kind of more general CFS, um, like the Fukuda criteria, which doesn't require cardinal symptoms versus those case definitions um, like the Institute of Medicine and 
um, kind of the Canadian criteria and there's um, that do require specific um, criteria like post-exertion malaise. So I think a diagnostic issue is critical, um, but we we we've done so. So if I could I could put on a napkin can kind of a an, an exquisite clinical trial that would be terrific to do um, that could involve dissemination um, and helping people on websites to learn these techniques. Um, but again, it really comes down to, um, you know, um, our governments willing to fund the types of um, programs that patients really want. Um, and the reality is there has been extremely little funding um, available for what the things I've been talking about. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right in saying that there, both that ME is more, sometimes more serious than is, uh, as you say, the the, um, the people with most serious disease are not able to participate in trials. And again, this survey we had with nearly 6,000 respondents in Norway, we repeated it in all of Europe in 2021. And I was really surprised to see that both in Norway and in every country in Europe, nearly 60% of the respondents said they were housebound. And 15% said they were bedbound. So 75% who hardly ever leave their homes. And um, that's not usually communicated. And I'm, uh, well, that, that's on a tangent, but I'm, sometimes it's said that 25% have severe ME, but I think, both that we need to agree on what we classify as severe and do studies that really show what the uh, um, distribution of severity is in the population. Yeah, and when we write articles, I might add, and we split patients into, you know, the least less severe and more severe or those who meet kind of more stringent case definitions versus less, we get hammered by the reviewers because um, they kind of say, what is this? It's just, it's ME, you know, and yes. why, are you, why are you breaking it up? Even though we show clearly that you get different results if you break them up and we do study after study. And, and if we published articles um, that basically enhanced stigma and showed that the patients were in a sense more psychogenically focused, um, we could get our articles in, you know, much um, it, it's, it's, there's a bias out there, unfortunately, um, and that's unfortunate. Um, but we do think that, um, you know, splitting patients into different groups um, is very important. Um, chronic fatigue affects almost one in 20 people. Um, fatigue is a very common um, symptom, and physicians um, and tertiary care people see common fatigue garden variety, lifestyle fatigue constantly. And then when they get someone who doesn't have the garden variety fatigue, they can't make a distinction between that and the person who's really sick with post-exertional malaise um, and, the, and the cognitive impairment and unrefreshing sleep. It has some type of kind of precipitating event. They have very difficult times of basically differentiating those two groups and if they don't differentiate the groups, the interventions that are appropriate for a person with garden variety fatigue is not the same as what's necessary for patients with ME. Yes. I would like to get back to that group you talked about with the uh, different immune markers, because you said did not ha see the same type of improvement as the ones without. Uh, I'm thinking even those patients still benefit from pacing at some level. I mean, they still should not overexert themselves uh, and just think that because I'm unlikely to improve, I shouldn't do this because if they don't, they might deteriorate even more. Uh, well, it's a good, interesting question. Um, you know, if a person is um, bed bound, um, you know, they're going to, um, you know, be in a situation where, um, you know, they're not going to be involved in much activity, um, but their energy level is so low. Um, so, but I think for anyone, I mean, basically, if if they're bed bound, 
um, they still, you know, some people are going to get up and, you know, try to get to the shower and go to the bathroom. Um, you know, you know, there's still exertion that's occurring, uh, but there's also cognitive exertion. Um, and is the patient, you know, laying there and basically stressed out because they're saying all the things they can't do anymore. Um, so if they're physically or cognitively being pushing themselves, um, that's not good. Um, you know, I've talked about, you know, physical um, exertion. There's also mental exertion. Um, and you don't want to basically be having mental or physical exertion um, that's beyond your limits. Um, it's easier to quantify the physical stuff, but the, the mental stuff is also important. Um, and I think that um, anyone, um, yeah, improvement is going to be probably less for people who are more impacted. But that doesn't mean that the person who is very, very impacted can't learn how to, in a sense, watch their energy, watch how much they're doing, watch how much they're exerting, watch how, because even a person who is bed bound will have fluctuations in their energy. And that's important to kind of say, what did I do that basically allowed me to have a little bit more energy today than yesterday or this morning from yesterday? Um, and what did I do that really made me sick? Um, and what was the stimulus? Um, you know, was it, um, you know, some type of um, temperature change? Was it some type of noise? Um, was it some type of argument that, you know, I got into with people? And, and I think, um, or was it just having to do more physical activity, even though they're mostly bed bound? Um, so it, it doesn't matter your level of um, kind of uh, physical functioning. Um, pacing is important for everyone. And my, I might add that that involves people who are impaired with ME and people who are not. Although people who are not can get away with doing a marathon um, and then re resting for a day, um, and then they feel fine. They're still pacing um, because they've done a lot and they basically are going to cut back. You know, when a lion gets mauled in Africa, um, what does it do? It paces. It goes into the bushes and lets its wounds begin to heal. That's what the immune system is telling it. And the fatigue, in a sense, is slowing it down so body can get re-regulated. This is a biological phenomenon we're talking about. It affects everyone and for people with ME, just more importantly. Thank you. I think we have got answers to most of the questions and we are beyond the hour that we uh, thought we would use. Uh, again, I would like to say thank you so much for a very interesting webinar and for answering all my questions afterwards. So um, we hope we'll be able to invite you back again at a later date and um, because this has been so, so great. So and I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who is here. As I said, we will have a webinar next Thursday about heart rate monitors. So please join us then. And uh, until then, thank you for today and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.